Hey there, folks. Glad you could join me again. If you've liked what you've seen, I'd really appreciate a like of this here video and a subscribe to this here channel. Last time, we scaffolded out some API endpoint routes for our application. These routes serve as an entry point to the application. Now that we have a way to interact with the outside world, let's plan and discuss our application's architecture. Here's a diagram of our application's architecture, or at least our account application's architecture. Before going into this too much, I want to give a shout out to the Go Clean Arch repository, which you can find on GitHub. This served as the inspiration for much of what I do in this project. Incoming HTTP requests are parsed and validated by the handler layer. The handler layer calls the service layers methods, which in turn access the repository via its methods, which uses data sources, which could be persistence, data storage, local storage, or whatever it might be. This is what we mean in the bottom when we say call flow, is that each layer on the left will call the layer on the right. And each layer depends on the layer to its right. Or in other words, each layer to the left depends on the concrete implementation of the layer to its right. All of these layers can work with and pass models to and from each other. These models hold the fundamental data properties, errors, and interfaces of the application. And so as you can see here, this model or domain uh, interacts or is handled by all of the application layers. So you might be asking why we go through all this trouble. Why don't we just fetch and store user models in the database from inside the handler functions here? Aside from the fact that I built this application as a learning exercise, this sort of architecture lets us build out and test the layers independently of each other. Let's go through an example. I've now reopened our handler.go file within our project. Inside of this handler.go file, I've created a route called me for getting the user's information. But what if we just want to test that the handler and its validation of incoming JSON is working as a unit or without respect to the rest of the application logic, which could be very complex and involved? How do we handle that? A typical approach is to create an interface. Interfaces take different forms in different programming languages. In Go, an interface is a set of methods. We can then say that our package depends on an interface. That would be something like this. Inside of our config struct, we might create a user service, us for user service, which takes a model.user service. Remember earlier in the chart, I said interfaces would be defined inside of this model package. But this user service interface doesn't actually do anything. It will just define what we expect an actual user service should or even must do to be able to interact with our handler. By creating this sort of abstract thing called an interface, we can create a mock user service and inject it into the config of our handler. Again, this allows us to test the handler in isolation of any actual implementation of a user service. The actual user service that we will create must have all of the methods on the user service interface to be able to be injected into this handler. So let's erase this for now and come back to it later. We'll also be creating a similar link as we created for the handler and service layers between the service and repository layers so that we can test the application's logic in the service layer without actually retrieving a user from a database in the case of the me handler at least. Note that some apps might further abstract away the data sources or use libraries to mock database responses, but we'll forego that in this application just as a heads up. 
All right, enough jabbering about application architecture. Let's write a little bit of the model layer to get us ready for next time. All right, I'm back inside of the project, and inside of the account project, I'm going to create a folder called model, which will hold our model package files. Inside of this model folder, I'm first going to create a model for a user by creating the user.go file. To this file, I'm going to add a user type as a struct, which contains the properties our application's user will have. Hopefully this makes sense. It's pretty basic. Our user will have a UID, an email, a password, a name, an image URL, which will be the URL of an image hosted on Google Cloud Storage eventually, and a website URL. These between the back ticks are called struct tags. The DB, as you see here, struct tag, maps the field names of this struct to the names of database columns when you use a library called SQLX. And we'll be adding that library later on. I mentioned this so that you understand that these tags don't do anything with the standard library Go SQL package. You need to have another library like SQLX to use these. The JSON tags are used to map or serialize and deserialize JSON to and from the user struct. Unlike the DB tags, these are used in conjunction with the JSON package in the standard Golang library. Similar tags exist for APIs that work with XML or forms. Now let's create interfaces.go and get started with our interfaces. So here we'll create the file. And this will also be inside of the model package as shown in the diagram. Make sure you declare a package. And then let's get started creating our first interface, which is the service interface. So I've just added a user service interface, which you can do by creating a type, the name, and then declaring it as an interface. And for now, we're just going to add a single method called get. And as a reminder, this user service is what we're going to end up adding inside of the handler config or as a property to the handler struct, which I showed earlier by example. Now I'm adding this interface inside of the model layer or package, but you might see some other applications where they'll add this interface inside of the handler layer because it's the handler layer that sets expectations for the service layer, right? Or you might even see it defined inside of the service layer, but people have different preferences. I liked the Go Clean Arch, how it put these all inside of the model layer, inside of a single interface file. And because this isn't so huge, I'm just going to use this single interface file as well. You can see here that we've also added a UUID, and I'm gonna save the file, which automatically imports this Google UUID, and these are just used to create unique identifiers to represent the user in the database. We'll go over later where we get this UUID from, but for now, let's just add it to the signature of the user service get method. Next, let's add a user repository interface. This will be added as a property in the service layer. So whereas the user service was added to the handler layer, the user repository or an implementation of it will be injected in inside the service layer. We create a method called find by ID, find denoting that we're going to look up this user in some sort of database or persistent storage. And we use by ID because we're later going to create a method called find by email and we need a distinction between the two. Next, let's create an error.go file or an errors.go file. Here, we're going to add all of the error types that we expect our application to return. We're going to create custom errors so that we can return a consistent string for the error type along with a specialized message for our application. 
For now, I'm just going to copy and paste my entire error file with all of the errors that I included in this application. It's a lot of code, so I recommend you go over to the GitHub repository and copy and paste it. And then I'll explain what it does here, but because there's so much boilerplate and a lot of it is repetitive, I think if I explain parts, you'll be able to understand the rest just by looking at it. All right, again, we add this to the package model, which is necessary at the type of at the top of all files. And then we're going to create a type, which I'm a little worried about using type with a capital T, but what's done is done. We can change later, I suppose. I've then created a list of all of the types of errors I expect to return in this application, such as an authorization error, meaning that the user is not authorized to receive some other user's information or they're not logged in. We have bad requests for validation errors, conflict. For example, if a user tries to create an account with an email that already exists, and that's an HTTP 409, or at least as best I could find on Stack Overflow. We have internal errors, which are for unknown server errors or fallback errors. We have not found error. We also have a payload to large error. So I'm going to restrict the user from uploading arbitrarily large streams of data. And this will be used for the user uploading their image. So also we create an error struct. And this is the shape of our error. As I mentioned earlier, we'll have a type which is one of these types that's listed here. And then we'll have a message. And we also use these JSON structs for serialization and deserialization, or as you read and go sometimes, marshalling or unmarshalling of the data. We also create this error method, which you can see as a receiver method on the error struct we just created. And this just simply returns the message property. Very simple. But we need to do this to satisfy the error interface of the standard Go library. And so we can pass our error as a regular error or return this error from any of our functions as a standard Golang error. We then create this status method here that helps us return an actual HTTP status code or integer. So for example, if we get a type of authorization, which is related to those strings we just defined. Then we're going to return status unauthorized, and we get these from the HTTP, HTTP library from Golang. And so for example, this would be a 401, conflict would be a 409, and so forth. So this is just a little switch case to map the error types. We also have a function status. Now notice that this is not called on our error struct. You see this one is called on the error struct and takes no arguments. Whereas this status is not called on our error struct, but receives the error. And so basically this does some type casting in this errors as. So it's basically saying, is the error we received, is it of type error? Meaning this error is the error we're building right now. So if it is, then return this status. And that's the status we mapped right here. Otherwise, let's just say this is a catch-all. Let's return a 500 status internal server error. Now down at the bottom, we have these sort of helper convenience factory methods. And these are used to build the errors out. And we'll use these in the layers of our application. So if we have an authorization error and we want to return it with a particular reason, we can instantiate an error which you see here with that reason. And there's the reason there. Similar with if you have a new bad request for validation, and you can see we just use some sprintf to create a custom string conflict. All of the errors will be like that. So hopefully this sort of structure makes sense. It may be a little verbose. I'm not saying it's the only way or the best way, but it seemed to work great for this application. So folks, that's all we're going to do today. I really appreciate you taking the time to learn with me, and I hope some of you will find this useful. We now have the basics of our model layer scaffolded out, which will allow us to write our first handler, service, and repository implementations. We're also in a much better position to test each of our layers in isolation. Thanks again for taking the time to watch this tutorial with me, 
And remember to like and subscribe.